Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Real Estate Live UK, a week-long programme of free events that are designed to get everybody talking about what's going to happen uh, to the regeneration and property industry uh, during and post-COVID-19. Um, now, this morning, we've got a really, or this afternoon, actually, we are just in this afternoon, I think, uh, we've got a really uh, exciting uh, conversation all about the importance of cultural organisations uh, and the creative clusters in supporting uh, the urban renewal um, post-COVID. Uh, we've got a lot of great speakers to listen to uh, and hopefully a lot of conversation from all of you that are watching. And I'd like to encourage you all before we start uh, to, to talk to us this morning. You can do that a number of ways. You have a Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your screen. Do feel free to, to type your questions into that function to any of our panellists um, and either myself or our chair, Tim, uh, will uh, we'll put those questions to our panel uh, at the appropriate time. You can also chat to us this afternoon, uh, use the chat function, share thoughts, comments, ideas, links uh, that would be helpful to bring this conversation forward. Uh, we really do want to use this opportunity to get as much insight from all of you that are watching uh, to help us work out uh, exactly what the future needs to look like. Uh, we're also running a poll across all of our sessions this week. Uh, we're going to launch this now. This is asking uh, what you would consider to be the most important factors in unlocking development and ensuring the continued strength of the UK real estate uh, economy. Uh, you've got a number of options to choose from. Is it transport and infrastructure? Is it technology and digital infrastructure? Is it building a carbon zero sustainable future? And you can have more than one answer. Is it investing in innovation, grants, enterprise zones and similar structures? Uh, is it FDI and the importance of inward investment promotion? Is it the delivery of housing? Or, or is it about the infrastructure and social infrastructure and a skilled workforce? So lots of things for you to choose from. We will um, announce the results of that poll uh, at the end of this session, but if you could all take few moments now just to give us your thoughts uh, that would be a really interesting um, and we look forward to hearing what you've all got to say on those important subjects but for now enough from me um, I'd like to invite our chair uh, for this afternoon's session uh, Tim Jones who is the cultural mile manager at the City of London Corporation uh, over to you Tim to introduce our panel Thanks, Catherine. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to um, convene this session uh, today. Um, so um, just I'm, I'm just going to talk briefly about where this session has come from. And uh, I'm going to show just a few slides just to hopefully um, develop people's appetite for really um, unpacking this topic with the panel today. And then I'll go around and I'll introduce the panel and invite each of them to, to give an opening statement. Um, so first thing I've got to do is just open up uh, my uh, second screen to show some slides to you guys. Hopefully this is going to work. Uh, yeah, here we go. So um, so this topic has, um, has, has come about. So so um, let me start by saying that I'm I've had the great fortune to work in the cultural uh, sector in this in the UK for about almost 30 years now uh, and worked across various different art forms and organizations and particularly since about 2008 I've been doing so in a, in a kind of built environment regeneration uh, and city making context which has been a really kind of thrilling opportunity to see how the cultural and creative sector uh, can really connect with um, other sectors and uh, the wider public sphere and help effect some kind of change and to develop uh, urban vibrancy and senses of place and deliver support for communities and great design and so on in the process, which has been a really, uh, a really kind of thrilling journey to be part of. Uh, but one that at the same time has been one that has been quite uh, incoherent in terms of how those sectors talk to each other. So I've just been talking to, the, to this panel before this session uh, about how these conversations can often go. And because the cultural sector is, is funded, as, as I'm sure many people will know, in a very particular way through getting the majority of its finance from public funds like the Arts Council or from private philanthropy, it can often exist in a bit of a kind of um, economic uh, bubble from the rest of uh, other industries, which means that when there is an opportunity for it for, to advocate its value, it can be a, a bit kind of simplistic and crude about 
uh, how it expresses its value and what it can do to kind of get money from other places. I'm really keen to have a conversation uh, with the panel today and to take your questions about how we can really find the most effective points of contact between the cultural sector or the cultural sectors and, and the built environment sector, given that there is, seems to be a kind of huge um, uh, understanding, uh, a consensus that's emerging that apparently was born out after the keynotes on, on yesterday, yesterday, yesterday morning's keynote of Real Estate Live about how culture and creativity are essential for urban vibrancy. And we really need to put them at the center of thinking about how we uh, recapture that sense of dynamism, competitiveness, animation, and community benefit that we want our cities to be about. So it's a great thing to be talking about this today. And I'm just gonna whiz through these slides really quickly, just so that people have got a sense of um, where what I'm about and where I've been coming from. Culture Mile is a cultural district project that's based in the heart of London. It was launched in 2017. Uh, it started doing its major projects in 2018. And I've been around in that in that partnership, which uh, since since mid 2018, and it's made of, up of the City of London Corporation as essentially the founding partner for it, working with these four amazing cultural organisations, the Barbican Centre, the Museum of London, the Guildhall School of Music and Drama and the London Symphony Orchestra. Uh, for those who like their maps, this is just to be crystal clear about where exactly in the City of London we are. So the City of London is based smack in the middle of Zone 1 in the heart of London. Uh, you can see on the right hand side of this slide exactly where the boundaries of the square mile are. And Culture Mile is in the north northwest part of the City of London. Uh, runs along the border of Islington, as you can see here. Uh, it's about 18 percent of the of the surface of the square mile and uh, includes uh, it, it's a kind of wraparound around the Museum of London, the Barbican Centre, the Guildhall School of Music and Drama, and includes the existing museum site, number two on this map, uh, you can see here, and also includes uh, the markets at Smithfield, uh, where we've recently announced in the city that um, the, the Museum of London is going to move to West Smithfield, and there are plans of uh, and and we've published plans on, on our intentions for the rest of Smithfield markets, what's known as Smithfield Central Markets. It's also a mixture of residential as well as um, business, as well as health. We have Bart's Hospital in the area uh, and various other facilities. It's a really astonishing place. It's also a place that has uh, uh, 2000 years of history in it, which we're concerned to really harness as we develop this area going forward. Culture Mile exists to do these four things, uh, to transform the area. So that idea of how we can put culture at really the heart of major infrastructure projects and public realm designs, as well as thinking about how we can use the streets and public spaces to really animate this place with and, and really make sure that the creative and cultural credentials of the area are, are really understood. Supporting the local economy is very key to what we want to achieve. There's a variety of uh, businesses uh, uh, in the area, large and small, as well as other types of organisation, thinking about how we can really support those businesses, particularly at this point, to become sustainable and to uh, make more connections and develop themselves is a really important aspect of what we should be doing. Using creativity to boost social mobility is a, a key aspect of what Culture Mile is about. There are significant cultural uh, education programs that are run out of our partners. We also have Culture Mile Learning, which brings together all of the institutions of the Square Mile that deliver um, a creative and cultural learning. Um, and so we want to really use it for an active purpose uh, to really support uh, employability, skill development, life opportunities, particularly for Londoners that might not necessarily be exposed to the creative industries or have that opportunity. And then convening connections and unlocking potential is, a, is a, an aspect of what we do just through endless kind of partnership building and brokering uh, to make sure that everybody in the area gets better at these kind of creative collaborations. Uh, we do have major projects coming through. I've mentioned the Museum of London already, which is a huge move happening in 2024 and an opportunity for the existing Museum of London to completely reposition it and reimagine itself as a, as a 21st century civic space facility. Asif Khan, who's on our uh, call today, I'm sure will have more to say about that. And then 
Um, the other point I wanted to make about Culture Mile, particularly as it relates to how it connects to the commercial and the built environment sectors, is that I've always really envisaged it as something that brings the cultural, the city and the commercial sectors together in, in a great partnership. I think if one of those sectors is left to become too dominant in terms of cultural district making, then uh, it can compromise the quality of what, you, what you're what you doing. But there's a real sweet spot that brings together that sort of sense of planning and long-term stewardship that the local authority has, the smarts and speed and, and deeper pockets that the commercial sector have, and the brilliance and the creativity that cultural, the cultural sector can have that, that together can really make these places sing and make them kind of magnets for innovation and visits and community benefit and great, great art making. Uh, we, in terms of our topic today, I just wanted to allude to our context, which is um, one in which there are lots of creative, uh, there's a lot of creative clustering in the area, and we're hoping to play a very dynamic role in that. In January of last year, we brought out the Creative uh, Innovation and Enterprise Report. Uh, which showed this this really interesting stat, uh, which the city of London hadn't really picked up on before, which was between 2010 and 2016, workers who work in a creative profession in the city of London grew by 88%. So that's double the London average over that period. So there's obviously something going on in the city. We also had over that period practically double the amount of uh, businesses starting uh, that could be considered creative enterprises over that period. So there's something going on in the city in terms of its creative industry credentials uh, that I think is really powerful. And there's probably something that that can be harnessed in terms of the convening power and the collaboration catalyzing power of a, of a cultural district like Culture Mile, which I think could play a really, really good role in this. Of course, like everybody, we've been dealing with um, the... Um, COVID-19 outbreak and thinking very much on our feet as we all have of what we can what we can do about it. Since March our response as a district has been fourfold to support local residents so in terms of the residents in the area uh, we've got the highest proportion of uh, residents anywhere in the square mile within Culture Mile itself particularly in the Barbican and Golden Lane it's, it, estates so we've been thinking about how we can re redesign our programs or offer activities that support a sense of togetherness and optimism for the future. Um, supporting local businesses seems very key to us uh, to make sure that SMEs in particular can sustain in the area. Uh, it's felt important to double down on young people's learning since the COVID outbreak happened, just because um, the we can see that the trends that mean that certain young people don't get anywhere near these kinds of opportunities are being exacerbated and, and particular um, underrepresented groups are likely to get further away from engaging with culture or finding ways into employment in the culture and creative industries. And of course, we've been working with our major partners in terms of how we can eventually and safely reopen the district and, and invite people back to have a great experience in the area. Um, so I guess I'm convening this panel as much because I'm I'm trying to think of solutions and ways forward about how Culture Mile can work as a cluster, you can use its creative clustering uh, ability and how its organisations should, should be best positioning and linking and thinking about how to sustain themselves, bearing in mind that with organisations like the Barbican or the Museum of London, we are looking at challenges which are greater than what we've seen in our life, lifetimes before. Um, I wanted to very quickly introduce the panel. Um, so I've said more than enough to kick this off, I'm sure. Uh, I'm really pleased to have a great panel for you um, for what remains of this hour. Shona Manson is here, who's Assistant Director for Culture and Creative Industries at the GLA. Caitlin Warfield, who uh, who's, uh, who have offices at Brookfield Properties, some of which are in Culture Mile and with whom we've been developing some great collaborations, is the Marketing Director for Europe and is able to give us her perspective. Maria Adebowale Schwarte is the CEO for the Foundation of Future London and, um, and is um, really sitting behind the development of East Bank over on the Olympic Park. We have a partnership relationship, particularly around education work between Culture Mile and East Bank. And it would be great to get from you, Maria, the, the perspective from a different part of London. And Asif Khan is here, 
who uh, is a, um, a brilliant architect on the team that's behind the building of the, the realization of the Museum of London. So thank you all for joining me. Um, Shona, I wonder if um, I could ask you to just kick off with a uh, three to five minute um, um, commentary on um, how you think the pandemic is affecting the creative industries in London and what we should be doing about it. Thanks so much, Tim. Yes, of course, I'd like to say it would be a pleasure, um, but as you'll find out, the results are uh, pretty devastating and a right call to action to all of us. So thank you for having me here. Um, I think it's really important to start by uh, impressing, and I know there's been a lot of, of, of talk and appreciation of this at, at Real Estate Live this year, the importance of the creative sector to London. It really did lead the world before the pandemic, and it will absolutely go on to play a vital role in London's economic and social recovery. To put that into context, it generates 58 billion a year, provides one in six jobs in the capital, and the sector was growing four times faster than the average UK economy, and jobs were increasing at three times the rate prior to COVID. Uh, and it's a huge driver of tourism and hospitality. Um, but with lockdown, culture, creative industries and the nighttime economy faced an absolutely immediate and really catastrophic impact, being the first and the hardest hit uh, by lockdown and those uh, closures of business. So we had events cancelled, venues closed, creative and hospitality supply chains dried up and income for the creative workforce, 50% of whom are self-employed, was completely wiped out. So at City Hall, we really rapidly reformulated our funding to give director support to where it was needed most. And I think in that speed was absolutely key. We quickly commissioned research with Creative Industries Federation showing that London's creative sector and its supply chain stand to lose up to 16 and a half billion by the end of 2020 and up to 152 and a half thousand jobs. So as I said, devastating. Um, by April, we'd established a £2.3 million culture at risk business support fund to help those who are most at risk of insolvency. And so far, we've given grants to 122 organisations through that, supporting 11,500 individuals. And we worked with the mayor's existing programmes like Creative Enterprise Zones and London Borough of Culture, making sure that they could give their funding directly to businesses and creatives too. We know that the pandemic, as Tim has said, has amplified and exposed really systemic issues which have just got to be addressed for culture and the creative industries to become more equitable and sustainable. Creatives themselves, um, although a lot of what we will discuss today is about infrastructure, you know, they are often the most unable to access investment or funding and they've been amongst the most vulnerable in the pandemic and they're the engine of the industry. Likewise, cultural production businesses like exhibition fabricators and recording studios have been left out of government grants while their income has been completely decimated by the closure of the venues who commission them. Um, so Tim mentioned at the top of this session the way the culture sector is publicly funded um, and with reduced public investment over the past decade, I thought it'd be useful to note that the sectors had to move to become more and more commercial and some organisations have done that really successfully. But what we've seen in this crisis is that it's those organisations who've been the most commercially successful and with the least or no public investment who've been most left out of government support. Um, you know, we feel funding really has to be rebalanced to make sure that there's equitable distribution to individuals and to that really crucial creative supply chain. We commissioned a, a study of case studies last year that showed the creative supply chain uh, spends another £40 billion pounds a year, um, as well as to institutions. Uh, but of course, as Tim has said, culture is about so much more than the economy. It's proven to improve our health and well-being. It supports young people in really important ways. And um, it's proven to reduce social isolation too, which is hugely relevant in this context. As societies in London and around the world faced lockdown, you know, we've all seen how people turn to creativity to help them through, whether that was choirs on balconies or digital dance or poetry or paintings. I think it's absolutely never been clearer that creativity is at the heart of who we are as human beings. Um, in terms of what this means for clusters, I think what we've seen in London is that uh, during COVID-19, cultural districts and clusters in London have really stepped up to harness that passion and, and kind of need for culture, making things happen locally in new ways and really driving innovation. Districts have always had, completely by definition, a core focus on place. And what we're seeing in London uh, and in other world cities around the world is a, a shift to the hyper-local and to domestic tourism as movements restricted and people and businesses turn to what's closest to them. 
This chimes with shifts in practice that the mayor had already been advocating for through his culture strategy and the idea of culture on your doorstep. Many districts in London have renewed their focus, particularly on the kind of civic and community role that they play, supporting local well-being and showcasing really what essential spaces and partnerships they are in these challenging times. For example, in Culture Mile, they distributed nine and a half thousand Culture Mile play packs to families without internet access, working through food banks and mutual aid groups and community centres. So really tackling digital exclusion. And uh, in our inaugural London Borough of Culture from 2019, Waltham Forest, they quickly mobilised a volunteer workforce who had existed because of the cultural programme. They're called Legends of the Forest and they're absolutely amazing. And throughout COVID, they've been helping at the Food Distribution Centre, delivering food parcels and prescription medicines to vulnerable residents. So I think one of the things I hope for is that we'll really see more civic action from creative clusters in future. Um, Two other points. The first is that we've also really seen how building diverse networks through clusters will help them succeed in uncertain futures. Um, the mayor established the UK's first six creative enterprise zones to help artists and creatives put down roots um, in this city. And um, at the heart of those, the zones have cultivated local consortia of creatives, artists and local people, which have really been the zone's unique strength and advantage during the crisis. So it's given them the kind of built-in ability to provide immediate targeted support right where it's needed for at-risk and diverse creative businesses. You know, those councils and partnerships have really got their fingers uh, on, the, on the buzzers. So despite COVID-19, the zones are still on track to deliver 40,000 square metres of affordable creative workspace. And then the final point I wanted to make in terms of clustering is about high streets. We know that high streets have got a huge role to play in helping our cities to recover, and they represent a really great opportunity for innovative cultural clustering. Um, you know, it's no secret that high streets were already in decline prior to COVID-19 with a 12.1% retail vacancy rate. And this crisis has really accelerated the need for them to, to reinvent. And they're crucial places for culture. Um, a recent study showed that over 80% of London's cultural production and consumption spaces are on or within 200 metres of a high street. Partnering that with the fact that we know cultural organisations can enhance community cohesion, increase footfall even if retail is struggling, repurpose vacant buildings and create sound employment. Uh, that makes for a really exciting opportunity and it's also why business improvement districts are such crucial partners for local culture. The new e -class, uh, uh, EU's class gives access to shops and other premises opportunities that weren't available to Workspace before. And at the GLA, we've commissioned a sh short study through the Mayor's Workspace Advisory Group to explore that. So we're excited about high street, how high streets can diversify and play a really important role in creating cultural spaces and new local clusters to support changes in the ways people will be working and living during and post COVID that we know are coming and that we have to tackle. Thank you. Sharda, that's, that's fantastic uh, to kick us off. That's brilliant. Um, Caitlin, you're, um, you're at the heart of where all of this potential um, benefit uh, that these cultural activities and practitioners can give us kind of slot into a, a very commercial context because Brookfield have been doing it for years and presumably have very hard-nosed commercial reasons about why that makes sense to them as well as what it does for the day-to-day -day experience of the people who go in and out of the, the offices uh, that you curate. Could you tell us a bit about why Brookfield does that and, and how you know it works and how you think the pandemic has affected it and whether there's going to be any kind of change in uh, position that the company is going to take. Sure, so um, just to kind of back up, so Brookfield, for those of you who don't know, we're a major uh, landlord owner um, developer of real estate globally. So in London, we have about 12 buildings in the city and then um, own a majority stake in Canary Wharf. So. To us, obviously the streetscape is extremely important to the cities that we have tenants coming through every day. And especially right now, as, as people are working from home, we've done a lot of work around studying what we think will happen in the future and you know how we bring people back to cities. And, and we do, we are optimistic that people will come back to work. Work will shift at that, you know, as time goes on, but but that was to be expected anyway. And we 
really feel that culture is at the heart of that. You know, why do you come to work every day? It's really to interact with your colleagues. It's to kind of take in the environment around you. It's to, you know, grab a coffee and go see a piece of art somewhere um, around your office. And I really, you know, that's really at the heart of what we do and why we support the arts in the way that we do. Um, we've had a arts program central to our business for about 30 years. We launched in New York and have brought it to every single city that we do business in. Um, and it really is a key component to our strategy. Um, we aim to bring our spaces to life through culture. So we have significant public realm space and we activate this um, through, throughout the city, throughout London. And we've continued to do so during the pandemic. Even as most offices are closed, we have seen that our buildings have been operating at about 20% vacancy um, of people coming to the coming to work every day. So we made the executive decision to continue to activate those spaces for the people that were coming to work. So we brought food trucks in, we continued our partnerships with artists. Um, we're working on a partnership with Culture Mile and LSO. So we've had a longstanding relationship with the LSO where we did a pop-up concert at London Mall Place, which is one of our buildings within um, the remit of the Culture Mile. And where we've decided to shift that programming kind of on a large scale to next year, we are still working on a smaller digital partnership that will be broadcasting across one city and a couple of other partners to kind of continue that connection to the city and culture, because we really think it's that important as do our investors. Um, in, uh, tenants are really at the heart of everything we do, and we know um, that they really appreciate the ways that we can activate our sites with impactful, thought-provoking interventions. Um, while COVID has interrupted working life as we know it long term, it's unlikely that working from home will replace working in the office. Um, we envision that working from home will be a supplement rather than a substitute to the office. Um, in the medium term, we really want to create a responsive public spaces and invite workers that are still coming in to connect socially in a safe and distance environment. So again, like I mentioned, we continue to activate our spaces and work with our tenants. We've also been trying to support our retail tenants to make sure that they have a space um, to grow in the city and attract people to come back. So for instance, we worked with an artist here at City Point, which is where our offices are where I am now. Um, to kind of put together a seating pavilion where we were anticipating, again, doing a bigger activation. We've partnered with our retail tenants to do some silent disco and to have yoga programming. And we found that those programs have been fully booked, which has been really amazing and a little unexpected on my part, but really happy to kind of see the engagement there. Today, we're doing a press day with Matt Smith. We have a partnership with the Crafts Collection um, at 99 Bishop's Gate, and that is another intervention that we decided to continue to move forward with. We had to shift it a little bit due to social distancing measures, but still wanted to push it forward because we do want to remind people that we do these programs to kind of bring them back into the office in a safe and mindful way. Um, we'll be looking for collaborations in the future. I think closer to home, we'll be working with partners such as the City of London, Culture Mile, and um, the Eastern City Partnership Bid, which we've been actively involved with. Um, we think we have a significant capital to invest in these programs, but one of the key components is making sure that they activate in the public space because we just think that's so important to how, um, you know, we reinvigorate the places that we are to bring people back to work, to, you know, have people enjoy the city for um, the special place that it is, um, and we'll continue to do so. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, Maria, can, can I turn to you? Um, you're um, so you're heavily enmeshed in the realization of East Bank over in the Olympic Park. Um, so in a way, a, a kind of a similar kind of construct to Culture Mile in sense of multiple cultural organization partners all collaborating on something that we very much hope is going to be a, a beacon for East London and very much more than the sum of its already huge parts. But of course, you're in also uh, in a very different part of London from the centre. And I think we're all aware that a lot of the um, uh, learnings that have happened as we've got beyond the lockdown have been about the difference in terms of how outer London is doing to uh, inner London. And this idea of the donut effect where the central London gets hollowed out. And yet we're seeing signs that um, outer London is uh, potentially doing better. Could you tell us a bit more about... Um, how you've been getting on over at East Bank, particularly since the pandemic uh, hit us, and 
what you're learning about what revitalization might mean in in east london that might be di distinct from what's happening in this in the square mile oh we can't hear you sorry i think what the foundation is learning is is similar to our other cultural partners actually um, we're an independent charity and part of our aim is to invest in um, East Bank within the four boroughs, but also work with our East Bank partners as well, who are major creative um, institutions. And so, yes, COVID-19 has, has hit hard on some of the local communities, the businesses and social enterprises. Um, and so we've been looking to be as agile as we can with the funding and the grants that we give out. Um, and also just making sure that those grants are resilient and flexible for the needs of um, the sort of culture sector. I should say the culture sector within East Bank and the four boroughs is quite wide. So we're talking about anything from um, performance, um, dance, social entrepreneurship, supporting um, new uh, arts and culture um, projects, training and employment. And so what we're trying to do is to make sure as you both said, is opening, making sure those doors are open for very diverse communities and businesses. So they also can bring their skills and understanding and passion back into the creative industry and they're supported with the funding from the foundation. It's been hard, but I think the, the main thing is for us as a foundation to stay resilient, and as I said, as agile as possible, and just to stay committed to an authentic engagement with the local communities there and asking what do they need to actually create East Bank as this amazing cultural quarter, which, you know, it's the biggest um, investment from London and City Hall since the 1851 exhibition. So we want to make sure that that lands properly and that it's support and it's focused on the cultural sector, but it's also incredibly inclusive. And we, we've seen, haven't we, in the last couple of months about how important it is that the creative industry and any industry actually is inclusive because that's where we get the talent and the best kind of um, performance and employment. Um, we're looking at the moment, um, we're st we still have a very, um, how should I say, ambitious commitment still, and that is still to the 1 million visitors, it is still to the 2,500 jobs, and it's still to um, creating a 1.5 billion um, generation for the local company, the local economy. That will take time. Um, we probably are two to three years, um, require another two to three years to do that. But I think what we've been looking in is working with two major partners, um, Cultural Mile and City of London, and also Westfield Stratford City. Because I think for the foundation for East Bank, what's been crucial is that we have funders and partners that really understand the importance of culture and education, and support and so we've been working um, very much around build better no, no one left behind and in that with the culture mile as you said um, Tim is that we've been looking at the fusion prize and soft skills and in this kind of day when we're looking at innovation and some jobs been lost as we move into the future actually those kind of skills and creativity are absolutely crucial and with City of London we've been able to put um, towards one million pounds towards in the next three years um, a lot of major projects and the Fusion Prize has been a really good example of working with young people, social entrepreneurs, looking at how they develop soft skills and some amazing innovation projects that will go on to be, um, you know, um, employment building um, projects. With Westfield Stratford City, one of our major donors, they've been absolutely brilliant and actually absolutely crucial part of Foundation Eastbound's thinking is that we are creating a cultural quarter, but we're also talking about um, creating a public realm that's inclusive. We're also talking about inclusive placemaking and how that's designed. And so we've just um, been putting out a, a number of grants, small, medium and large. If anyone's interested, they should go to our Foundation Future London website. But they've been focused specifically on supporting businesses, social entrepreneurs, um, NGOs and, and organisations that are interested in developing um, projects, jobs, um, networks within the creative industry. And that's been absolutely crucial to maintain the resilience um, and to support the, the boroughs who are actually, some are really reeling from the, from the impact of C19. So we want to listen, be there and provide that, that financial support. 
Um, I think that's been a crucial part for us. Um, and we're trying to deliver. And as I said, listening is really important, finding out what's, what's required and making sure whatever we do is co-designed um, and, and has, um, has resilience at, at the heart of it. Fantastic, thank you. Asif, finally, if I, uh, if I can turn to you, thank you for joining us. Uh, Asif jumped on, on, on the call just literally before the, the, the seminar started, so we haven't, haven't had a chance to say hello. Um, uh, so, you, so you're uh, at the heart of the um, the team uh, developing the designs for the for the new Museum of London. Um, it will be great, and there's there's um, great materials already out there. Um, uh, the, the Lord Mayor of London uh, convened a conversation between Asif and Sharon Ament, the the director of the Museum of London, which I would advise anybody who's interested in this what we really hope is going to be another landmark cultural project for London. I'd really encourage you to to Google it and look it up. Um, could you, could you, for the purposes of today's conversation, could you briefly summarise what that's been about and particularly talk about how you're reflecting on it, given nobody knew the pandemic was going to happen? And, uh, and and think about, you know, be um, it's always great to talk to cultural and creative people because they're so optimistic. So I'm assuming that somewhere in your reflections as well as some, some opportunities and benefits that might come out of how you've been uh, thinking about how to conclude these designs. Thanks, Tim, and, and very nice to hear about uh, uh, East East Bank and the projects going on there, Maria. I, I kind of I'm, I live in that neighbourhood, so it's it's a, and it's a, something I'm watching very closely. Um, down at um, uh, near Farringdon, to so the old Smithfield Market. I'm just for the for the, for the, for the audience there. I thought I'd introduce a little bit about the project. Um, for those who don't know, Smithfield has been London's meat market for you know nearly a thousand years. It's a place steeped in history. It's, it's um, Charles Dickens um, wrote about it as being covered with filth and fat and blood and foam, and um, certainly still got a sort of meaty smell to it if you if you if you walk around the streets there. Um, but times have changed, and uh, um, the general market, the fish market, have been derelict for sort of over twenty years. Um, and when Sharon's collection, Sharon Ammon's collection at the at the existing uh, Museum of London in the Barbican grew to such a size, you know, seven million objects uh, that the the building and their storage facilities have kind of reached carrying capacity. They they looked at this uh, derelict building down the road and thought maybe that could be a solution for them to 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 rehouse the museum, to kind of repot the plant, and take the opportunity to. Um, so do a little bit more, recast the institute in a new way. So um, to take it from uh, something that was very, you know, quite avant-garde in the 70s to, 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 now, um, to now slowing down a bit and, and, and kind of being uh, um, really getting to the, con use the confines of its own building, challenging the way it's uh, able to show program and so on, to taking on a new space and being open to the public in a very new way. Um, I'm going to share with you some images. I don't know whether uh, it's possible. Yes, it is possible. Okay, great. Um, so let's see. Um, this should go up full screen. Um, Tim, do you see the images there? You see that? Okay, great. So here's a sort of bird's eye view. You're looking at the, the Smithfield General Market. Uh, and we're, so we're sort of helicoptering just above the fish market. And on the right hand side is the poultry market. So. Uh, we're looking at a suite of buildings that were that were uh, built and designed in the 1880s by Horace Jones. He's the architect who uh, who designed the uh, you know, the Great Tower Bridge uh, and uh, Leadenhall Market and so on. Um, they're robust um, uh, utilitarian buildings of the day, and uh, uh, I don't think a market building has ever been turned into a museum before. But it it gave us a um, a really interesting uh, vessel to, to kind of work with. One of the challenges of the buildings, though, is that they are in terrible condition, having been left derelict for, for, for over 20 years. The, the poultry market, as, as you may know, is, is currently sort of, um, you could say, winding down. There are a few traders left there, but that's also part of the, the scheme and this bigger plan to move from being a trading quarter um, to being a cultural quarter. And this, this um, campus, you could say, forms the the western end of the Culture Mile, uh, Tim, as you had mentioned it, with a Barbican at the other end. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's sort of anchor. Um, and if we think about uh, the sort of position of it, today you could say that it, uh, or this was a kind of diagram we gave in our pitch, 
to the museum four years ago, the competition pitch, that, that the museum could be seen as um, a new center of London, where these sort of traditional um, locations of the seats of power, the creativity, the, the kind of new world of tech and startup around Old Street Roundabout, um, and all the history in between, could start to, um, to you know, inform this new building and this this uh, it could absorb all of this influence from around it. So we had the idea to use the original market uh, uh, shops, which are around the edge of it. You can imagine it's a high street sort of wrapped around uh, a square ex facing outwards, but also facing inwards inside a covered market hall uh, to, uh, to suggest the museum to use those shops to invite partner institutes into. So this is a museum uh, like no other city museum. It's more like a coral reef where partner institutes can plug in and be part of an ecosystem and what's interesting about that is uh, uh, with the museum's collection at the center and these sort of ever evolving uh, uh, family of like-minded institutes, you know, they could be um, uh, social enterprises, they could be um, um, educational trust, things around design, art, music, apprenticeship. Uh, they could be future facing, they could be, uh, you know, futurologists as well as archeologists. Um, they create new forms of content, they create new forms of, uh, of audience participation, and they create kind of a creative tension between, uh, let's say, the museum, it's, it's kind of traditional way that work is shown and, uh, uh, and interpreted, and, and, they, and they cater to kind of new demands of, of, of the visitor, which are, I think, evolving at a pace that like, traditional cultural offerings can't, can't always uh, keep up with. Uh, the project is a collaboration. Uh, the design pro of the project is a collaboration between my studio, so Asif Khan's studio, uh, um, Stanton Williams uh, Architects, and Julian Harrop Architects, and also um, um, a whole suite of fantastic uh, um, engineers, transport engineers, you know, Adams Cara Taylor, AKT2, um, Momentum, uh, Gerald Leaf Planning Consultants. It's, 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 it's an enormous uh, group. and. Um, and of course, the museum and uh, Sharon Amherst at the head of it are our um, very strong collaborators. So this this project is born out of um, of their vision, and uh, and I guess our drive and trying to kind of make this thing happen. Um, the Corporation of London are um, the, the, the core partner, along with the GLA, um, um, delivering the the kind of the financial uh, backing for the project, um, and. Um, I think the overall aims for it are to be um, to present an open um, an open space where all kinds of things can happen, uh, a new space for the city, probably the the, the greatest undiscovered, unknown uh, covered space in London. This is the General Market Hall, which is uh, the size of uh, Oxford uh, Oxford Circus. Um, sort of, we're kind of here imagining it through images. What could happen inside of this fantastic covered dome? It's not the original dome because uh, this one was. Uh, fell apart and uh, uh, following uh, V2 bombs in the Second World War, but there's, there's this sort of an, uh, fantastic history embedded in it of change over time, and our work will be the sort of the most recent chapter in its history. Uh, internal cafe, Paleo Botanic Garden. Um, we also have this idea that um, it's very important to the museum that that it's able to um, respond to the already existing. Uh, night scene in Farringdon. So this is a museum. It's a 24-hour museum. It has a it has a nightlife. It pulses with the city, uh, and um, we've got this this amazing kind of canvas, which you see a little element of there of of, um, of lettering, which is a canvas for art, for activism, for um, uh, for words from the city, from poets, from artists, um, and this is I think over 200 meters wrapping around the building of, of lettering, which has changed over time in relation to, to seasons and, 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 and stories. Uh, and then I'm, I'm so sorry to jump in and, and rush you, but I'm just conscious that um, I, I'd like us to get to a, a few questions before the, before the panel. Uh, by all means, keep this, keep these uh, images up because they're beautiful to look oh, at. Absolutely. Absolutely. If, if we could just kind of begin to talk and, and exchange between ourselves as, as we're looking at this stuff, I guess my, um, my, my my question is really like I'm conscious that if you go to the Asif Khan Studio website, you see the Museum of London amongst the uh, uh, enviable portfolio of like really great cultural projects that you've been you, you you and your practice have been involved in over the years. 
uh, which is uh, remarkable and really exciting. I guess, you know, if we assume we're at some kind of historical hinge point now with, with the pandemic and what it's brought upon us, um, it would be really interesting to hear your thoughts about um, how the design of these kinds of projects and these kind of buildings might be evolving post-pandemic. And Shona made a really interesting point earlier about creative clusters and about how she'd like to see them take um, you know, get more involved in civic action. And I'm aware that part of the uh, way that the vision for the museum is, is explained is something that we wouldn't have heard you know, 20 years ago, the idea of the museum being a major new civic space uh, for London, it would have probably been dis described as a, a place to experience the collection, you know. So, so your thoughts on that and about how um, cultural buildings, old and new, should be thinking differently if they're really to play the best possible role in in revitalising the cities in which they they're, they're based. Uh, yeah, it's it, it's a really important question. I think I think uh, I think all of us now are reevaluating have had the chance to as long as if we haven't if we haven't been affected by covid we've had the time to reconsider our relationship with the city and um our relationship with um i guess our own lives and the values our own value systems uh, and i spend a lot of time um doing simple things reminding myself um that growing things are important or learning new skills uh, um, sewing sewing fixing holes in in, in socks that needed done <laughs> this kind of activity spending time with family um i think uh um, it's a it's a it's the role of a museum a city museum like this uh to to reflect the environment around it and to be a sort of a sounding board for ideas that are ruminating already in the city and i think that's that was already the idea um, that Sharon wanted to implement in the museum, but I think the crisis has become a the COVID sort of crisis or the, this sort of um, um, I guess it's it's a sort of crisis of public space and 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 and, and behaviour in for citizens. Um, I think that's brought that issue to home. Um, we've got a lot of very large spaces in the museum, which used to be uh, a, a place for trading and. and um, a market hall where goods were exchanged and these will now become places where ideas are exchanged and i think these sort of um this collection of partner institutes that i mentioned um is probably the can be imagined as 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 clusters as creative clusters and they're able to to um i guess they'll be on variable tenancy rates they'll that's what we're hoping they'll be there'll be lots of different types of groups demographics um, social backgrounds and so on that can that can be involved in those from kind of high culture to sort of really basic fundamental things like making um the so you know what we're trying to enable the museum is to be resilient and i think by do to be resilient and to and to, for your message to never become obsolete you've got to allow the present day in so uh, the whole of that general market ground floor is dedicated to the present day they're calling it um, london within living memory um uh, there's, a, there's a better name for that, but I, I can't remember what, what it is. So, you know, imagined London and past London, and the, these are kind of things that you would expect. But the idea that um, that there's this mirror held up to ourselves in our own lives um, that you can go and explore, it, I think, is quite unique. Um, and um, and it is a, it is a civic space that's that's replacing a lot of lost spaces like that. So this is probably. Um, going to be the library uh, library space for London that we all missed from our childhood, and it's probably also going to be the, you know, uh, the cafe around the corner that disappeared, and it's probably also going to be the um, the place where we 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 meet our friends, we make new ones. I, you know, I think a lot of us that are involved in the project. Uh, we believe in it, but it's going to be down to the people like yourselves, like all of you listening, um, to to go there and make it your own. Uh, and that's, I think that's what's very exciting. Um, we're just making the space. Yeah, and there's a kind of delicate, um, uh, there's a delicate um, dance, I suppose, that's involved. There's something around um, sort of de cultural democracy and inclusion going on, and uh, but also happening post-pandemic with the 
with actually quite substantial and rapid calls for much greater equity and inclusion, particularly in terms of people's representation in cultural businesses and, 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 and in the arts more generally. Shona. Yeah, I just was um, going to say on that, I guess I think it's about asking ourselves, what kind of value do we want to create? What kind of value do we need to create? And, you know, if you take the new museum model, it was absolutely ahead of that curve. You know, in thinking about that kind of high street wrapped around the building, it wasn't just thinking what return do I need to make on letting this? It was thinking what's the social value I can bring to this area and kind of activate and amplify in this area. So I think that's an important question to to ask ourselves. What's the kind of um, holistic value that we can create through space. Yes, and this phrase, um, building back better, is is kind of on everybody's lips. It's now, you know, on the wall behind uh, our, our current government as they um, deliver their online conferences. And it's one we've been using in Culture Mile for, for quite a bit when we've been thinking about particularly the role that we can play as a, in a district in, in supporting a new generation of SMEs oh. to come to the fore. I guess I'd be interested, I'm, I'm, I'm terrible at keeping time and I'm conscious that we've got eight minutes left. I'd, I'd really be keen to, to hear from this group about what people's thoughts about building back better means uh, from their perspective. And particularly, I suppose, where, the, where, those, uh, where that agenda and what Shona describes as this, you know, this question of what kind of value we want to create, where that connects in, in terms of the agendas and opportunities that the built environment sector specifically can can, can join up with this on because there's a clear consensus that I, I, I feel that culture and creativity is essential if if cities are going to be able to pick themselves up but how do we do we need to make new tools to do it do we need new alliances what where are the opportunities here um, I think oh, sorry, Go ahead. sorry. <laughs> okay there's not enough time uh, Kate, I think had her hand up first okay go on. Okay, sure. okay, sorry. Um, just, just quickly, like on that notion of the flexibility of space, and I think the plans, I've seen the plans for Museum of London, they're incredible. And I think that interweaving of the community and art and all those things in this one space is so paramount to what the future of the city will be. I think that places should not be signified as this is the office district, this is the insurance district, this is a museum. I think all of those things really need to intersect to make a community successful. And that goes for retail, it goes for green space, it goes to diversity, it goes to culture. You know, we're trying to really infuse culture in untraditional space. That's really the model that I work for, work off of at Brookfield because we have a lot of untraditional space, but it gets people who don't necessarily see culture on a daily basis or wouldn't necessarily go to, you know, a museum to see that in there every day. And we work with cultural partners to kind of help pull those people then through to the cultural spaces, um, hopefully. I mean, that's the goal. And, um, you know, Maria, I'm sorry, I will. I will. No, don't be. I mean, I actually agree with what yeah. you're saying. I was just thinking about this idea about, you, you know, building back better. I think it's about civic space, which is, is also about bricks and mortar, but is also very much around green spaces and, and, and designing in inclusion rather than exclusion. Um, and, and so for East Bank partners, their buildings that are going up, it's very much about creating a civic space. It isn't just a place which um, provides some kind of um, performance, which excludes local communities, for example. Those spaces are where people can sit, think, learn, get training, teach. Um, and so as you were saying as well, Kathleen, it's kind of like we're creating spaces which have multiple uses. It's about bringing people together. It's also about creating a healthy economic climate um, locally. And it's also a space by which we can rethink what we mean by culture um, and innovation. And I think the thing about East Bank is that it has this amazing diversity, um, lots of social entrepreneurs starting up very young boroughs actually, um, young people wanting to get involved in those um, in the creative industry. And I, I think actually an example of our um, ambition, but also whether or not we've built these great places that we've all been talking about, is who's going to be in our jobs in the next 10 years? You know, is it going to people that don't look like us, younger people, bringing something different? So I think we should be looking at breaking down the establishment with cultural quarters and um, green spaces, but also through creativity, what we want to be doing is saying, this is inclusive, 
we're ready for change. These are the spaces, we're opening them up. And what we're also saying as a foundation is, we'd like to collaborate and co-partner with organizations, donors and funders to help deliver and design this new space for the future. Amazing. So there's a call for, um, I suppose, a kind of an unbounded, uh, a newly unbounded approach to culture. Absolutely. And one, one that you think, Maria, can work on um, retrofit cultural districts like Culture Mile, as well as new ones like East Bank. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I think all it means is an open mind. I think the will's there. And, and certainly the public commitment, that's, that's what's wanted. And that's what the Build Back Better is. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Shona. Thanks. I just wanted to kind of pick up on that um, point about what's needed. I think one of the cheapest success stories we've had at City Hall, um, it's not been cheap in terms of everyone's hard work, but it's been the culture at risk office. So, you know, the focus of that is taking cases where organisations are at risk of closure and then brokering conversations between the different partners. You know, they could be licensing authorities or landlords or uh, funders about how to come to an agreement around that that allows it to continue and to, to thrive. And for me, that has been about, you know, it's about transcending languages and about helping people to understand, again, that value proposition in the round and come to an agreement on that. So there's something about alliances and languages, but I think also in all of that, we've just got to say really clearly, we've got to talk about money and investment, and we've got to talk about where it's going and we can't be shy about that. So we need alliances, but we also need a kind of willingness to talk honestly about money. Does the, uh, does the culture at risk office um, have, um, I mean, presumably, Shona, it benefits to a degree by the kind of mayoral muscle behind it, in a way. Yes. Is, there, is there something about it that could be pluralised? Is there a way to take the sort of brokering, the logic of the brokering language and appeals that it makes and kind of get them seeded much more widely across the city? Definitely. So, for example, with our creative enterprise zones, we've already been working with them and they've kind of effectively mostly set up their own mini culture at risk approaches. You know, it's something we want to talk about nationally as well. This isn't just for London. It's a really, really kind of simple, proven methodology. But yeah, I mean, it could sit in, in so many different contexts. Um, that, that, that's, that's really encouraging to hear. And how do you... Um... How do you ensure that the, what is defined as the culture that is risk? Is it something that f feeds into what Maria's just been talking about rather than, you know, a, a sort of set of uh, things that outside parties might look at and think, oh, God, this is something that the mayor seems to have kind of got, uh, you know, a pet project that we've got somehow to take on board for political reasons. How do we make people feel the, that sort of sense of inclusion and ownership in it that, that Maria was alluding to? Well, we've got to we've got to monitor and kind of assess what what it is we're focusing on for a start. And we've done a lot more work um, around that, around how we promote the culture at risk office, around the kinds of partners that we work with. I think you're totally right. I mean, you know, the message has to be there that it's there and it can provide to people. But if you put it into context, we dealt with 350 cases from 2016 until the beginning of this year. We've dealt with 630 plus now. It will be moving quickly since March alone. So I think, you know, there's been a real chance to kind of test that methodology and the reach. Um, but we've got more work to do on that. You're right, Tim. It, you know, it, it can't work if it's not inclusive. No, sure. I mean, you know, uh, but also it's a very, uh, it's a relatively recent initiative, isn't it? The Culture and Risk Office. So I suppose like all things, it's, it has to find its feet when the ground underneath it is less stable than it's ever been in, uh, in a way. And prior um, to this, it was one officer. <laughs> <laughs> not now. Um, we're, we're, we're rapidly approaching the end and I, I apologise to people listening for having done such a terrible job of answering any any of your questions that have gone on into the, the chat bar. I'm slightly relieved that there aren't there isn't a tsunami of them. And thanks to Shona as well, who won up and there seems to have done some kind of sets up some kind of meeting off the back of it uh, for somebody who was interested in talking about their project. Uh, the, organization, the organisers of Real Estate Live have said that they will... Um, allow us access to the questions where we can then feed back to everybody at the end of it. Catherine, did you want to say anything about that? Uh, yes, we will share the questions uh, with you all uh, offline. And then if there's anything in particular you want to pick up directly, uh, you will enable you to do that with the participants uh, that have asked the questions. So uh, thanks very much for that, Tim. It's been um, a great hour, lots of very interesting conversation. Uh, it's such a big subject, it can't possibly be uh, tackled in an hour, um, but we have other opportunities to take forward this cultural and creative conversation during the rest of Real Estate Live. Um, so 
So for now, thank you to Tim and all of the panellists um, for your involvement uh, this afternoon. Uh, we're heading um, into a few more sessions this afternoon. Um, we are looking at infrastructure in the new world at two o'clock, and that's particularly in relation to garden communities and the southeast. Um, and then we're looking um, at an opportunity to hear about broken homes and a discussion about the UK's housing market and the likely impact of the government's, government's planning uh, proposals. And that's with a great double act of um, uh, Jackie Sadek um, uh, and, um, uh, and Bill, so Peter Bill. So that's going to be a very lively conversation to end our day. But for now, uh, I just want to share with all of our panellists and with you watching uh, the results of the poll. Um, I think they're going to come back up on the screen. Just interesting to see what uh, people have said this afternoon. Um, we've got uh, out in front at 46% the importance of technology and digital infrastructure um, uh, and closely followed um, at 43% with carbon zero sustainable futures followed by transport infrastructure and I will just give a shout out that also tomorrow we have another city uh, of London uh, panel uh, where we'll be looking at digital in terms of how communications uh, can be helped and how uh, workforces and visitors can be encouraged back into the city uh, through the use of the communication channels of social media and websites and other things. So lots more conversations to be had. Um, a huge thank you to everybody for taking part uh, and thank you for you, to all of you for watching and hopefully we'll see you at another session this week soon. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.